Good day, everyone. My name is Daryl Kimball. I'm Executive Director of the Arms Control Association here in Washington, D.C. And I want to welcome everybody to our, our webinar on challenges and prospects for further U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control. For five decades, U.S. and Russian leaders have agreed that verifiable restrictions on their nuclear arsenals are in their national security interests and those of the global community. But those guardrails today are at serious risk of disappearing. The last remaining treaty regulating the world's two largest nuclear arsenals, the new Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, will expire in exactly 1,100 days on February 5, 2026. On August 1 of last year, President Biden announced he was, quote, ready to expeditiously negotiate a new nuclear arms control framework to replace New START when it expires in 2026. But he noted that uh, negotiation requires a willing partner operating in good faith. At the time, President Putin said Russia was open to dialogue on ensuring strategic stability in improving the situation in arms control. But since then, the two sides have not been able to agree on the resumption of inspections under the current treaty, which were suspended in 2020 due to the pandemic, and Russia has linked talks on resuming those inspections to tensions arising from its war in Ukraine. So unless the two sides can resolve these issues, uh, Russian and U.S. arsenals will be left unconstrained for the first time since 1972 when New START expires. Uh, our session today is going to explore the situation, uh, the risks of, uh, of failure to uh, resume the U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control dialogue. And we're very pleased today to have with us uh, Deputy Assistant uh, to the President of the United States, Kara Aber Abercrombie, uh, she's also coordinator for defense policy and arms control uh, for the White House National Security Council, and she's going to be talking today about uh, the Biden administration's approach to these important challenges. And then after she speaks and we take a couple of questions, uh, my colleague Shannon Bugos will moderate a discussion with our panel of experts, Steve Pfeiffer, Hannah Note, Matt Corda, and they're going to review the issues and potential solutions for maintaining constraints in U.S in Russian arsenals uh, to take a look at Russia's approach to nuclear arms control right now and to evaluate how US and Russian arsenals might grow if they're unconstrained after 2026. And not, last but not least, uh, to close, we have with us here Ambassador Yarmo Vananen, uh, who is Ambassador on Strategic and Arms Control for the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And she, he's also the chair designate of the 2023 Nonproliferation Treaty Preparatory Committee meeting, which will take place later this year. And as I said, we'll have time for questions along the way uh, through the Q&A function. So if you have questions as we move along, please use the Zoom Q&A. So uh, if we could have Ms. Abercrombie on the screen. Uh, with that, let me welcome you, Cara, to uh, this webinar. Very much appreciate you being with us to outline the president's approach to engaging with Russia on nuclear arms control, and it's important for the United States and international security. Thank you. Thank you, Daryl. And thank you to the Arms Control Association for inviting me to speak with you this morning. You know, this is an incredibly important topic and one that doesn't often get the attention it deserves in today's challenging environment. So I want to first express my appreciation to this community of experts and organizations like the Arms Control Association for your steady efforts to elevate this issue, arms control, nonproliferation, and keep it firmly in the policy discourse. Uh, so this morning, I plan to first provide an overview of the Biden-Harris administration's approach towards arms control and risk reduction. Then I'll speak to the specific challenges we face today in our bilateral arms control agenda with Russia. And finally, I'll speak to some new promising areas for risk reduction that we're actively pursuing. So first, let me begin by describing our overall approach. As you know, and as Daryl alluded to, President Biden has long been a supporter of arms control and nonproliferation efforts throughout his career as a senator, as vice president, and now president. And that has very much guided his administration's approach to these issues. The president's national security strategy highlights the need for sustained collaboration among nations around the world to prevent the spread of weapons of mass destruction and fissile material, their means of delivery, and enabling technologies. It commits the United States to working with allies and partners, civil society, and international organizations to strengthen arms control 
and non-proliferation mechanisms. And we've been doing this. Over the past two years, we have reinvested in multilateral institutions. We've re reinvigorated our diplomatic efforts, working with like-minded partners. Our national security strategy, which was released only last October as the war in Ukraine raged on, makes an explicit point of stating that our efforts are especially important during times of conflict when escalation risks are greater. We continue to seek pragmatic engagement with competitors about strategic stability and risk reduction, emphasizing measures that head off costly arms races, reduce the likelihood of miscalculation, and complement U.S. and allied deterrence strategies. Our nuclear posture review reinforces this promise. As part of the U.S. commitment to reducing the role of nuclear weapons globally, the NPR highlights arms control and nonproliferation as vital elements of a balanced approach. Importantly, the president demonstrated his commitment to arms control and risk reduction from day one. One of the president's first acts in office was to renew the New START Treaty for the maximum of five years allowed for in the agreement. The extension provided a baseline for a reestablished strategic stability dialogue with Russia designed to build the foundation for the next generation of strategic arms control infrastructure with Moscow. Unfortunately, as we all know, Russia's illegal and unjustified war of aggression against the sovereign country derailed those plans. So that brings me to the second point of my remarks this morning. Where is the United States in our bilateral efforts with Russia? Yesterday, uh, the Secretary of State, on behalf of the President, submitted a report to Congress which concluded that Russia is not complying with the New START Treaty. Russia's refusal to facilitate inspection activities prevents the United States from exercising important rights under the treaty and threatens the viability of U.S.-Russian nuclear arms control moving forward. Russia has also failed to comply with the New START Treaty obligation to convene a session of the Bilateral Consultative Commission in accordance with the treaty-mandated timeline, despite our best efforts to work with them. On a positive note, Russia has a clear path for returning to full compliance, a resumption of inspections, and regular bilateral consultative commission sessions. For our part, there is nothing preventing Russian inspectors from traveling to the United States and conducting inspections. The New START Treaty remains in the national security interests of the United States. It continues to constrain Russian strategic nuclear forces and provide insights into their weapons and infrastructure that we would otherwise lack. The United States will continue our efforts to return Russia into compliance with its obligations. And we will do so because the United States continues to view nuclear arms control as an indispensable means of strengthening U.S. ally and global security. It is all the more important during times of tension when guardrail, guardrails and clarity matter most. I want to emphasize yet again that the United States remains ready to work constructively with Russia to fully implement the New START Treaty. I'd now like to turn to the, the final point uh, in my remarks today and discuss the avenues we are pursuing, including some promising new areas. We are at a critical juncture in arms control and risk reduction, where many of the traditional measures of success in this community, strategic arms control with Russia, weapons reductions, treaty making, cooperative action to reduce WMD threats are changing. In both Russia and China, our bilateral efforts have been robust, and they have used their status and influence to block progress in critical multilateral institutions and venues. Let me be clear. The United States remains open to working with partners acting in good faith on legally binding strategic arms control. When we are able to use traditional arms control mechanisms to make progress, we will do so. And we've demonstrated this. Last December, when the review conference of the Biological Weapons Convention concluded with a plan to plus up the BWC Secretariat and establish a working group to further strengthen the effectiveness and implementation of the convention. It was not an easy road to get there, and it faced resistance from Russia and Iran, but the United States' continued engagement in the Biological Weapons Convention demonstrated that states' parties could come together to set out on a new chapter. Similarly, the United States has been working tirelessly with our international partners to uphold the norms against chemical weapons use 
despite Russia and Syria's efforts to seed disinformation into the conversation. Just last week, the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons published a report attributing the heinous chemical attack on Duma, Syria in April 2018 to the Assad regime. We applaud the team for its thorough analysis, which marks the ninth chemical attack independently attributed to Syria by the UN or OPCW mechanisms and underscores there can be no impunity for the use of chemical weapons. And as you're all aware, last year, after weeks of negotiations and years of pandemic-related delays, the 10th Nonproliferation Treaty Review Conference drew to a close without a consensus final document. Despite the challenges of the past years and today's complex global security environment, we should reflect positively that 150 countries were finally able to come together in a dedicated collective effort to reinforce the treaty's importance as the cornerstone of the nonproliferation regime. Ultimately, it was only one state party, the Russian Federation, that blocked consensus on a final document. The fact that all other state parties were prepared to accept the full draft final document and even Russia objected to only a few paragraphs, proves that there is still considerable alignment of interest and that there remains strong support in the international community for the NPT. And as the current chair of the P5 process, the United States remains dedicated to pursuing meaningful dialogue amongst the P5 to reduce nuclear risks. Even as we work to bolster existing institutions, we need to be creative and find avenues for incremental progress on risk reduction, utilizing forums where Russia and China do not have a veto, while also highlighting to Moscow and Beijing the risks posed by their obstructionism. This creative approach extends beyond the nuclear sphere, and we believe it will increasingly involve building and promoting norms of responsible behavior to curtail strategic risks. Last year, Vice President Harris announced that the United States committed not to conduct destructive ascent, direct ascent anti-satellite missile tests. We were quickly joined by a diverse group of like-minded nations who recognized that such tests were dangerous, unnecessary, and unacceptably increased the risks of collision for all space-bearing nations. This joint call to action resulted in over 150 countries voting for a UN resolution against these tests effectively enshrining a norm of responsible behavior that will help reduce risks for years to come. In the current world, creative, unilateral, and plurilateral efforts like this direct ascent ASAT norm, with coalitions of countries committed to shared principles, offer an avenue to continue to make progress, as does the United States' ongoing and increasing support for the independent international institutions and structures that are critical to arms control and nonproliferation. These efforts may not always get the headlines of a binding treaty, but are no less important to our broader goals of increasing strategic stability and reducing the risks of unintended escalation through modeling good behavior and exporting sensible strategic best practices. So in a year when the global nonproliferation and arms control regimes have been placed under increasing strain, when North Korea and Russia have engaged in nuclear saber rattling, the need to reduce nuclear risks could not feel more urgent. So once again, I want to applaud the event's organizers and all of you who are engaging in these issues day to day for your commitment to helping policymakers identify solutions to these challenges, increase stability, and improve prospects for peace. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks for being with us. Uh, that was a very um, detailed and comprehensive uh, overview. Uh, and I just wanted to um, forward a couple of questions that have come in, um, both of which are about what the solutions are. Uh, Michelle Kellerman from National Public Radio specifically asks, uh, what is the US doing to convince Russia to resume inspections under New START? Or are you resigned to the idea as Russia seems to be, that New START will expire without a replacement in 2026. And before you answer that, let me just also note for everyone that this morning, uh, Kremlin spokesperson Dmitry Peskov did say that uh, Russia wants to preserve New START, despite what he called a destructive US approach to arms control. 
he said that it was necessary to preserve at least some hints of continued dialogue, no matter how sad the situation is at the present time. So uh, what are what what is the administration trying to do to convince uh, Russia to resume the inspections and continue the dialogue? Yeah, thanks for those questions. And I think, look, first, um, pointing to Mr. Peskov's comments this morning, I think that just underscores once again that both countries continue to see arms control and, and the New START Treaty to be in our mutual interests. And that is a good thing. Uh, and so, and, and I continue to believe, you know, we have people we can work with in both countries. So, Looking ahead, and, and especially in light of what we reported uh, to Congress yesterday, you know, the United States will continue to emphasize to Russia that it does have a clear path for returning to full compliance, um, allow inspections on its territory, just as Russia has done for years under the New START Treaty, and meet once again in the bilateral um, BCC mechanism. And that's where we've been able to engage very constructively, again, for, for many, many years. Um, we're also going to continue to emphasize that effective implementation of the New START Treaty is in our mutual security interests. But Russia's noncompliance does threaten the viability of the New START Treaty and, frankly, the future of U.S.-Russia arms, nuclear arms control. So since Russia has been clear that it seeks to leverage New START Treaty implementation against the United States support for Ukraine, we must be equally clear that the United States will not make such concessions. The president's been quite clear, will continue to support Ukraine for as long as it takes. The Russia must implement the legal obligations it has taken upon itself, just as we continue to uphold and implement the obligations that we've undertaken. And we've demonstrated again, in, even in the Cold War, time and time again, that we are able to uphold these treaties obligations even when there are other challenges in the bilateral relations. And so finally, again, particularly to this group, I just wanna say the United States will also ask the world, nations, independent stakeholders uh, to work with us in urging Russia to return to full compliance and seeking to ensure that the New START Treaty remains an instrument of stability and predictability, not just for the bilateral relationship, but for the world. And just quickly, if you could, one last question before we we have to let you go and we move on to our panel. Um, the Russian uh, government has insisted, and many of our independent uh, Russian uh, nuclear expert friends uh, claim that uh, the United States has not dropped the so-called barriers for Russia to uh, enjoy the benefits of reciprocal inspections. You mentioned this briefly in your opening the compliance assessment report that came out yesterday addresses this too. Could you just elaborate on what the United States has been willing to do in order to facilitate Russia's rights to inspect U.S. facilities? Sure, you know, Daryl, that's a good question and an important one. I do think the report speaks for itself and, as you noted, goes into um, quite a bit of detail. Uh, but rest assured, we've done everything in our power to lift any potential obstacles to Russian travel to the United States in light of certainly um, the limitations imposed on Russian travel more broadly globally because of its actions in Ukraine, uh, we have undertaken to ensure they have a clear um, a clear path to travel here. There, there are absolutely no barriers as far as we are concerned to facilitating Russian inspections. All right. All right. Well, to be continued, I want to thank you again for joining us um, and uh, for continuing to press ahead uh, to address nuclear risk on behalf of uh, the White House, the president, and the country. Thank you very much for joining us. Thanks, and I hope uh, you have a very successful rest of this event. I enjoyed being here. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. All right, well, now we're going to turn to our expert panel uh, discussion, which uh, my colleague, Shannon Bugos, who's a senior policy analyst here at the Arms Control Association, is going to facilitate, uh, and then you'll see me a little while later uh, for the last part of the session. So Shannon, over to you. Great, thank you, Daryl, and good morning, everyone. If the panelists don't mind turning on their video, we can get started. So I'm very much looking forward to this panel that we have ahead of us. Joining me here on screen now are Stephen Pfeiffer, Hannah Note, and Matt Korda. Stephen is an affiliate of Stanford University's Center for International Security and Cooperation and a non-resident fe senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. 
He previously served as a foreign service officer, which included time on the National Security Council, at the State Department, and as a U.S. ambassador to Ukraine. Hanna is a senior research associate with the Vienna Center for Disarmament and Nonproliferation, where she focuses on arms control and security, con and security concerns and their implications for U.S. and European policy. She is also a member of the U.S.-Russian-German Deep Cuts Commission. Last but not least, Matt, Matt. Matt is a senior research associate and project manager for the Nuclear Information Project at the Federation of American Scientists. He is also an associate researcher with the Weapons of Mass Destruction Program at the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute. So logistically, each of our speakers will provide remarks for about 10 minutes, and then we will open it up to Q&A with the audience. Just as we did previously, if you have any questions for any of our panelists at any time, just pop it into the Q&A function in Zoom. We'll get started. We've already had an excellent setup this morning from Kara and Daryl. So we'll jump right into it. We'll go Stephen, Hannah, and Matt. So Stephen, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks very much, Shannon. Um, let me talk a little bit about new, the new Strategic Arms Reductions Treaty, New START, uh, its implementation. And then I'll talk a bit about what might go come beyond New START. Uh, first of all, New START was uh, implementation began in 2011. And it has reduced the level of U.S. and Russian strategic forces to levels that you haven't seen in decades. So, for example, its predecessor, the first START-1 treaty, allowed the United States and Russia each no more than 1,600 launchers for intercontinental ballistic missiles and submarine-launched ballistic missiles and heavy bombers. New START cut that number in half, allowing each side no more than 800. And whereas START-1 allowed each side up to 6,000 attributable warheads, New START, which had slightly different definitions, uh, provided limits that reduced it really by a third to no more than 1,550 deployed strategic warheads. Uh, in addition, you had a full range of verification measures, uh, data exchanges, notifications, which continue. Uh, the sides exchange about 2,000 notifications a year on real-time changes in their strategic forces, and the uh, treaty also allows for on-site inspections. Now, I would argue that the New START Treaty has significant security advantages both for the United States and for Russia. First of all, it reinforces strategic stability between the United States and Russia. And that's a situation in which neither side has strong incentives, even in an intense crisis, to resort to first use of strategic nuclear forces. Second, the treaty uh, enables lots of transparency and predictability each side knows much more about the other side's nuclear forces, and that allows each side to avoid worst case assumptions, which invariably cost money. Uh, third, the treaty allows cost savings because there are limits, there are restrictions on how far they can build up, funds can be used for other purposes, and also because the United States and Russia today control well over 90% of the nuclear weapons in the world, the New START Treaty enhances their credibility and non-proliferation. It's going to be difficult for Washington and Moscow to encourage others not to acquire nuclear weapons if the two largest nuclear powers are not limiting and reducing their weapons. Now, both the United States and Russia implemented the limits and they met the targets by 2018. In 2021, they agreed to extend the treaty till February of 2026. Implementation of the treaty has generally been smooth with three problems, one of which has been long-standing, two of which we've just heard about in the last uh, couple of days. Uh, the first problem is that the New START Treaty allows the sides to convert some launchers for ballistic missiles and heavy bombers to convert them to purposes so that they would no longer be accountable under the treaty. And the Russians have raised concerns in the past. This has been discussed in the Bilateral Consultative Commission. That's the New START implementation body. But they've raised concerns that U.S. procedures are not sufficient. That's been under discussion. I believe there's some progress has been made, but it's still an open issue. The other two problems we've heard about just in the last couple of days, one is back in 2020, the United States and Russia mutually agreed to suspend on-site inspections allowed by the New START Treaty. Uh, that was due to concerns about COVID. This last summer, in summer 2022, the United States proposed to resume those inspections, but the Russians refused. Uh, the Russians said that the resumption of inspections would confer unilateral advantages on the United States. They did not explain what they meant. Uh, and on-site inspections are important because the way the treaty is structured, both sides declare 
their number of deployed strategic warheads. When an inspection team visits a, a missile base or a port that holds uh, ballistic missile submarines, it's given a list of all of the deployed missiles at the base and the number of warheads on each missile. And then it can use on-site inspection basically to confirm that. It's on-site inspections that create the risk that cheating will be discovered that deters the sides from cheating. And so the longer we go without that, it's going to raise greater concern. Now, the, non the report that was issued by the uh, State Department yesterday said that because of the lack of on-site inspections, the United States today has less confidence in the accuracy of Russia's declaration of its deployed strategic warheads. Uh, and that's a serious concern, although the report said it's not yet a determination of non-compliance, and the U.S. government continues to assess that Russia likely meets the limits. It just has less confidence in that assessment. The other problem is that the Russians uh, refused uh, to have a meeting in November of the Bilateral Consultative Commission. At the time, they said it was a postponement, not a cancellation. But subsequently, senior Russian officials have linked holding that meeting to what they describe as the broader hostile U.S. attitude towards Russia. And in fact, under the New START Treaty, it doesn't say anything about postponing the agreement if there's a hostile attitude, but it says the sides have 45 days and the Russians have not met that commitment. So I agree with the Russians, certainly that the U.S.-Russia relationship is at its lowest point you know, since the end of the Cold War. Uh, but in the past, both Washington and Moscow have seen value in constraining their strategic offensive forces. And I would argue that that's even more important when relations are in a difficult state than when they're in the better times. Now, the Russian stance, I think, is regrettable. But the good news is that the two problems with compliance are readily fixable. The Russians could agree to resume inspections tomorrow, and they could agree quickly to hold a meeting of the Bilateral Consultative Commission. And I do hope that Russia will recognize that its interest in keeping strategic offensive arms limited means that it should be in full compliance with the treaty. Now, looking forward beyond New START, both Presidents Biden and Putin, uh, for example, in June expressed interest in doing something about nuclear arms control strategic stability after New START expires in 2026. Uh, and I think it's important that the sides get to that conversation, which probably requires first that we have a fully functioning New START treaty. But the Biden administration back in 2021 articulated some of its goals. Uh, it said that it wanted the next step to include limits on all U.S. and Russian nuclear warheads. The New START Treaty limits only deployed warheads. It doesn't do anything about reserve strategic warheads, and it does nothing at all about non-strategic or tactical nuclear weapons. And indeed, a U.S.-Russia treaty that covered all U.S. and Russian nuclear warheads would be a logical next step after the New START Treaty. Ideally, that treaty would have a single aggregate limit that would cover all nuclear warheads of the United States and the Russian Federation, strategic, non-strategic, deployed, non-deployed, perhaps then with a sublimit that would limit deployed strategic warheads, which are the ones that are most concerned from the purpose of strategic stability. Uh, and then you might have limits like the New START Treaty has on issues such as launchers and heavy bombers. That's a sensible goal, but there's going to be some problems. One problem is that China, which usually had or used to have about 300 nuclear weapons, is now assessed to be engaged in a buildup with a goal of 1,000 nuclear weapons by 2030. Unfortunately, the Chinese have not yet been prepared to discuss limits on their nuclear weapons, and that's going to raise the question, how far can the United States and Russia go in limiting those forces if China is building up in an unconstrained manner? And unfortunately here, the lack of transparency about its nuclear program from Beijing does not help. A second issue is that the Russians have never been enthusiastic about limits on non-strategic nuclear weapons. That's an area where Russia has a nuclear or a numerical advantage. And I suspect that the Russia-Ukraine war of the last 11 months may make the Russians even more reluctant to put those weapons on the table. And that's because you've seen underperformance by the Russian conventional military in Ukraine. And that could lead the Kremlin and the Russian general staff to conclude that they need to rely more on non-strategic nuclear weapons as a hedge against uh, uh, conventional gaps or conventional inferiority vis-a-vis -vis NATO or uh, China. And that could make it more difficult to persuade Russia to put those weapons on the negotiating table. That would raise the question for the United States. Would the United States be prepared to do another agreement that covered strategic weapons only? I think uh, possibly, but certainly an agreement that covered all weapons would be preferable. 
A third issue is that the Russians are likely to raise missile defense. <clears throat> this has been a question that the Russians have talked about a lot over the last 12 years. Uh, it's an issue that the United States would prefer to leave to the side. That could be a problem in a negotiation. A fourth question facing the sides is, would the U.S. Senate consent to ratification of any new arms control treaty, especially if it was done by a Democratic administration? And that may require that arms control looks at something less formal than a legally binding treaty, perhaps like the SALT-1 interim offensive agreement, an agreement where both houses of Congress approve it by simple majorities, or perhaps even something less formal. And then the last problem is time is growing short. We have three years until New START expires. That seems like a lot of time, but it's not a lot of time if you're going to try to do something ambitious. So let me just conclude by saying that I think properly structured arms control can contribute to the security of both the United States and Russia. And we should be thinking about what the world would look like if there were no limits on American, Russian, or Chinese nuclear forces. What would that mean for strategic stability? What would that mean for transparency? What would that mean for ballooning costs if there were an arms race? And what would happen to the non-proliferation regime? So there are serious reasons to continue strategic arms control efforts, but atmospherics now are grim and there are hard questions that the sides will have to address. Thanks. Thank you, Steve. And thanks for kicking off this panel by giving an overview of New Start, where things stand, where things may go. So we're going to go to Hannah next, and she's going to comment more on what Russia's motivations may be to participate in nuclear arms control. So Hannah, over to you. Thank you very much, Shannon. And yes, indeed, I've been asked to comment on the Russian position. Let me just state up front that I'm not speaking on behalf of the Russian government, but reflecting on Russia's position on these issues as I understand them as an analyst. Um, let me start by going back a little bit and providing some broader context for why we are where we are today with Russia and the New START Treaty. I think even as relations between Russia and the West were deteriorating in recent years, Russia signaled a continued interest in nuclear arms control. It supported the extension of the New START Treaty in February 2021. It remained compliant with the central limitations of the treaty as per the U.S. assessment and it participated in a strategic stability dialogue, SSD, with the United States um, over, over that period. And in that dialogue, and Steve has just hinted at it, Russia insisted on the development of what it called a new security equation, saying that an agreement should include all nuclear and non-nuclear offensive and defensive weapons with strategic effect. So Russia insisted on including things like US missile defenses, long range precision guided missiles and space weapons in that conversation. And Russia suggested that it would not necessarily be necessary to include all those elements in a single agreement, but that indeed there could be a package of interlinking agreements that have different status and also different modalities for accounting and verification. And I think the important thing to state here is that through 2021, as that work in the strategic stability dialogue was underway, yes, Russian officials kept saying that the United States and Russia remained far apart in terms of the scope uh, of what was discussed and how, how different things should link to one another. But crucially, until January 2022, I would say, Russia compartmentalized those discussions from growing tensions surrounding Ukraine. However, Having submitted security guarantee demands in draft treaty form to the United States in NATO in December 2021, I think that's when we see Russian officials starting to characterize the issue of future arms control and any replacement of the New START treaty as quote unquote secondary on the scale of Russian priorities. There was an extraordinary session of the strategic stability dialogue last January, just one month before Russia's invasion of Ukraine, in which Russia, in fact, tried to introduce some of the topics related to Ukraine and the broader European security order. So issues raised in these security guarantee demands into the SSD discussion. Now, the United States pushed back against that, saying that some of those issues needed to be discussed in the appropriate multilateral fora, such as the OSCE or the NATO-Russia Council, and that there needed to be consultation with US allies and partners. But I think this was the first sign that Russia was no longer really compartmentalizing nuclear arms control from other issues. Now, despite that, and even after the invasion, Russian officials seem to suggest 
for quite some time that they looked at New START implementation as unrelated to the war against Ukraine. I'll quote to you from an interview in April, last April, where Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov stated, I quote, we do not believe that the situation around Ukraine is relevant to the implementation of New START. At the same time, last spring, I think that's when you see certain signs of wars to come. The United States by that point had suspended the strategic stability dialogue with Russia because of the invasion, and Moscow frequently complained about that. Russia also indicated that Geneva would no longer be a suitable location for a prospective meeting of the Bilateral Consultative Commission under the New START Treaty. And then, as was already mentioned by previous speakers uh, last August, just as the NPT review conference was underway, Russia exempted uh, inspection activities under the New START Treaty. And then, of course, we get to late November when Russia notified the United States quite last minute of its decision to indefinitely postpone the planned meeting of the Bilateral Consultative Commission under the New START Treaty in Cairo. And if you look at Russian statements, interviews by Russian officials um, from, from recent weeks, I think they suggest that the Russian government at the highest level took a calculated decision to stop compartmentalizing the New START Treaty from the war in Ukraine, roughly one year after it had decided to compartmentalize to stop compartmentalizing the strategic stability dialogue. So Russian officials have stated that nuclear arms control is not immune to the broader military political situation, that the United States position over the war in Ukraine has made quote unquote business as usual on other issues impossible, and that the US has for too long ignored Russia's red lines regarding its security. And then after Western states pledged the provision of battle tanks to Ukraine just recently, uh, Deputy Foreign Minister Ryabkov stated that the broader situation remained unconducive uh, to setting a new date for the meeting of the Bilateral Consultative Commission. And uh, in an interview with Elena Chernyenko, who's a special correspondent for the Kommersant newspaper, he suggested that, quote unquote, the United States knows perfectly well which de-escalating steps Russia expects, first and foremost in the context of Ukraine. So... I would say we are essentially in a situation of hostage taking, one in which Russia has ceased to compartmentalize nuclear arms control generally and the resumption of on-site inspections under New START specifically from the confrontation over Ukraine. Um, and what Russia demands precisely uh, as ransom to release the talks from hostage is left somewhat underspecified by Moscow, but it is my own reading that Moscow is highly unlikely going to resume talks in the New START Bilateral Consultative Commission while Western battlefield support for Ukraine continues, especially if Moscow prepares for a new offensive in Ukraine this spring or fears a Ukrainian counteroffensive. So I think pending a durable ceasefire in Ukraine, I, I personally just don't see Russia shifting gear. And I would even go further and say that uh, in terms of sequencing, I'm not sure that Russia would be willing to resume discussions in the BCC, so make New START fully operational again as a stepping stone to a subsequent potential broader discussion on nuclear arms control. I think, in fact, what Moscow wants from the United States is for the US to signal a readiness for that broader discussion. Let's call it a strategic stability dialogue 2.0, because I don't think Russia will go back into the SSD as it was originally conceived. Russia wants to have that broader conversation over the European security architecture as it indicated in that extraordinary uh, session of the strategic stability dialogue last January. Uh, so where does that leave us? Um, I mean, on the positive side, Russian officials, notwithstanding all acrimony, keep stating that they view New START as an instrument of strategic stability. So if you look at official Russian reactions to the State Department's compliance report yesterday, they keep saying that. Um, but the question is really how long the Kremlin will believe it can try to blackmail the United States into abandoning support for Ukraine by threatening disruption to the New START uh, treaty. And yeah, as I said, I'm personally fairly pessimistic because right now Russia is at war. I think other concerns are considered of secondary priority. Perhaps what will happen after February 2026 is also not a focus in the Kremlin right now. 
given that it is concerned with an ongoing war against Ukraine. Now, Russian arms control experts have written and stated publicly that without treaty restrictions after 2026, um, it's the United States that could increase its strategic forces more quickly than Russia, and that in an emerging multipolar nuclear world, and if there's an unrestricted nuclear arms race, this would be especially problematic for Russia, given its one economic situation and be its geographic location. It's just the question whether those sober, rational insights will resonate with those who make decisions in the Kremlin today. Uh, let me just make one final remark because Steve, um, you know, posed sort of at the end the question, well, what does it mean for the world if we go into an unrestrained nuclear arms race between the United States, Russia and China? I think, you know, it is the non-West, non-Western countries um, that also have a significant interest in averting this. And if you look at the G20 um, summit in Bali and the final declaration uh, last fall, uh, they stated that the threat of uh, nuclear use or nuclear use is inadmissible. But these countries don't just have an interest in averting nuclear escalation or nuclear war. They also have an interest in averting a nuclear arms race. Most countries do not want to see that. And so there's sort of one question as to whether some of those countries, which still enjoy constructive ties with Russia, and some of which have arguably enhanced leverage with Russia today, could press Russia also to return into compliance with the New START Treaty and return to the negotiating table. So perhaps I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. And thank you to both you and Steve for giving the rundowns that are a little bit grim, but trying to weave some optimism in there. And you've already started to engage with each other with each other a little bit. And we've asked Matt to talk specifically about a world with unconstrained US and Russian nuclear arsenals. So Matt, let's bring you into this conversation. Over to you. Great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm just going to quickly uh, share some slides. So um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, to, to ACA for, for putting this fantastic panel together and to um, my fellow panelists as well for, for the really illuminating presentations. Um, I think as you know, as we're seeing with only a few years uh, left until new starts expiry and, and with more than a few roadblocks standing in the way of a new agreement, um, I think it's it's pretty clear that the panel could not be more timely. And so um, my colleagues on the panel have spoken uh, about the potential options to engage Russia on a new deal. And so my role here on this panel is really to talk about the stakes, um, more specifically, what happens if we fail to secure a new deal limiting strategic offensive arms? And uh, in November of this past year, um, myself and my colleagues at the Federation of American Scientists, um, Hans Christensen and, and Jess Rogers, tried our best to sort of project out what both sides could do in the absence of a deal. And so I'll, I'll sort of draw on that research now. And the hope here is that by understanding very clearly what the stakes are, we can recognize the inherent value of maintaining verifiable limits on both the United States's and Russia's strategic nuclear forces. And so an important factor that I wanna emphasize uh, up front here is that both the United States and Russia have meticulously planned their respective nuclear modernization programs based on a key assumption that neither country will exceed the force levels dictated by New START. If we don't have a deal after 2026, that assumption effectively goes out the window and both sides would likely default to mutual distrust um, amid fewer verifiable data points. And our discourse would largely be dominated by worst case thinking about how each other's arsenals would grow in the future. And we're already seeing this play out, particularly in the context of how some lawmakers are responding to the findings of yesterday's New START implementation report to Congress. And this is a quotation from the new chair of the House Armed Services Committee, stating that the Joint Chiefs should now be assuming that Russia is breaching the New START caps or will do so in the future, which is uh, not what the report accuses them of doing. In fact, the report specifically notes that the United States assesses that Russia was likely under the New START warhead limit at the end of 2022, and that Russia's non-compliance with allowing inspections does not threaten the national security interests of the United States. However, it took only a few hours after the US saying that they could no longer verify Russia's compliance for a leading politician to accuse them of uploading more warheads than allowed. And so with that in mind, we can only imagine what the discourse and the response would be 
if we no longer have a treaty after 2026. And so um, we can proceed with our force projections now. A couple uh, very quick caveats here. These projections are just that. They are projections based off of estimates. Um, they're not prediction, they're not, sorry, predictions, um, nor are they endorsements. Uh, and they don't take into account as well how the numbers of available launchers and warheads is, is going to change after 2026 when a lot of available uh, modernization programs eventually get completed. And additionally, you'll see that total warhead numbers um, are higher than those actually declared under the treaty because New START uh, artificially attributes only one warhead to each deployed bomber. And so we prefer to count in a way that uh, we think is more reflective of the situation on the ground. And so to really just, just to really uh, put a broad point on this, the, the tables are really intended for illustrative purposes and to give folks an idea of how each country's arsenal could realistically grow if they chose to sort of blow past existing New START force levels in the absence of a deal. And so we can begin um, with the United States, which has a uh, a pretty significant upload capacity with respect to its strategic nuclear forces. Um, although all of the current ICBMs that are deployed carry only a single warhead, about half of them uh, use a re-entry vehicle that's capable of carrying up to three warheads each. Um, and as well, the United States has an additional 50 uh, what are called warm silos, which could be reloaded with missiles if necessary. And so if you take those factors into account, the US ICBM force could potentially more than double from 400 to about 950 warheads. Uh, additionally, in the absence of treaty limitations, the US could also upload each of its deployed submarine launch ballistic missiles with a full complement of eight warheads rather than the current average of four to five-ish. Um, and then if you factor in the, the small number of submarines that are assumed to be out for maintenance at any given time, the US could also uh, roughly double the number of warheads on its submarines. Either of those actions would likely take uh, months to complete um, particularly given the complexities involved with uploading additional warheads to ICBMs and as well with submarines, you have to bring them back on a sort of rotating basis, you know, for port visits and things like that. But deploying additional warheads to bomber bases could be done very quickly, um, both in the United States and Russia. And uh, so we can see a pretty sizable potential increase there as well. So turning to Russia, which also has a pretty significant upload capacity, especially for its ICBMs, um, several of Russia's existing ICBMs have been assumed to have been downloaded uh, from a much larger number of possible warheads to a smaller number so that they can meet the new start force levels. And so this is an example of how new start over many years has continued to keep a cap on the number of deployed uh, nuclear warheads, both in the United States and Russia. Um, but as a result, without the limits imposed by new start, Russia's ICBM force could, could realistically increase uh, from approximately 860 warheads to, to roughly uh, 1,250. Um, additionally, with regards to the submarines, we were, you know, we're sort of in a similar situation. Um, those uh, missiles have also been thought to have been downloaded from an estimated six warheads, maybe to four to meet new start limits. And so without those uh, limits in place, those uh, the number of available warheads potentially goes back up. Um, and as in the, the US case, Russian bombers could also be loaded uh, relatively quickly with hundreds of nuclear weapons. And so, um, you know, we sort of have that have that here as well. So in a, in a nutshell, and remember these tables are really, they are meant to be for illustrative purposes, but in a nutshell, if both countries uploaded their delivery vehicles to accommodate the maximum number of possible warheads, both sets of arsenals could approximately double in size, relatively speaking. Um, the US would have more deployable strategic warheads but Russia would have a significantly larger number of operational nuclear warheads because of its sizable stockpile of non-strategic nuclear warheads, which are not treaty accountable. Um, it's important to note also that, that taking these actions probably wouldn't be that expensive for either country. Um, in 2020, the, the Congressional Budget Office estimated that if the US brought its warhead levels back up to start two levels, meaning 3,000 3, to 3,500 warheads, um, it would cost about $100 million to perform a, a simple one-time upload. Um, and it can be assumed, you know, a, a sort of a similar range in Russia, but as Hannah mentioned, this I think could have more dire consequences given Russia's geography and uh, quite, a, quite a different economic situation. But in the longer term, um, both countries could theoretically go a lot further and pursue even larger expansions of their strategic nuclear forces, potentially going up back up to the start one level of uh, 6,000 warheads each, but that, 
you start to get into a significantly more expensive territory um, because it would require the deployment of additional delivery systems. And so, you know, you can sort of see the Congressional Budget Office uh, has a has a pretty big estimate here, and that estimate does not include uh, Department of Energy's cost to produce or sustain or store more nuclear warheads, um, and the the acquisition costs are significantly more expensive. And moreover, there are expected consequences beyond just the warhead increases themselves, right? So if the verification regime and the data exchanges elapse, um, you we're likely to see both countries start to enhance their intelligence capabilities a little bit more to make up for the uncertainty regarding the other side's nuclear forces. Both countries are also more likely to invest in what they perceive will increase sort of their overall military capabilities. So not just nuclear forces, but also conventional missile forces, uh, missile defense, perhaps also a non-strategic nuclear force capability. Those all come with significant additional costs. And on top of that, these moves could also trigger potential reactions in other nuclear armed states that might decide to increase their nuclear forces and the role that they play in their military strategies. And in recent years, we've seen, uh, Steve mentioned China, but we've seen that China appears to no longer be satisfied with just a couple hundred warheads to ensure its security. And in a, in a shift from longstanding doctrine, may now be looking to size its own nuclear force sort of in response to the size of other countries' nuclear forces. And if that is indeed the case, then a significant increase in the size of the US nuclear stockpile, you can imagine a similar corresponding increase in the size of the Chinese stockpile. And then subsequently, you can play out the ripple effects for India, Pakistan, elsewhere. And so I think I'll leave it there for now and we can, we can get to questions. But um, I just want to emphasize that this is a sort of a grim picture, but it's not uh, inevitable. And, and as I think we've discussed on this panel, there's a really clear pathway for Russia to return to compliance, and there's still time for both countries to return to the negotiating table uh, in good faith. And so I think uh, for all our sakes, I hope they do so very soon. So looking forward to questions. Thanks so much. Great. Thank you, Matt. And thank you again to all of our panelists. So we're going to shift over to uh, some Q&A. And I want to start with packaging two questions together for you, Hannah. So in your remarks, you had focused a bit more on compartmentalizing um, and how Russia's priorities have shifted over recent years in that regard. So first of all, we had a question that about Rose Gautamaler's piece this morning in the Financial Times. Rose was the chief US negotiator for New Start. So writing in a Financial Times article, she made the case that for a variety of reasons, it is in Russia's national security interest to re-engage on New START implementation and follow-on negotiations, taking a page from the Cold War practice of decoupling strategic arms control from bilateral, bilateral tensions. What more can be done to encourage Russia to pursue such decoupling as such a decoupling approach despite the Ukraine war. And I know in your in your remarks, you had said that this is already very unlikely. So in that case, I wanna tack on this other question we had gotten about if direct arms control dialogues don't begin soon, how can the US set an example which might reinforce arms control? Or as you had said, maybe signal that readiness to just go straight into the broader discussion about arms control. So I know those are two fairly broad questions, so take them where you want to, but over to you. Sure. I mean, to come back to the issue of compartmentalization, it is something that Russia practiced vis-a-vis -vis the United States for quite some time over the last years, even as uh, relations grew more sour. And it was usually nuclear arms control and also nuclear non-proliferation that was in particular being compartmentalized. I think what you're now seeing in the context of the war against Ukraine is that compartmentalization seizing on the Russian side, actually not just regarding the New START Treaty and talks with the United States, but we've seen it at the NPT review conference last summer. I would actually pose to you that Russia has also ceased to compartmentalize the Iran nuclear dossier. It's been less constructive, I would say, in talks related to restoring uh, the JCPOA. And now it's the New START Treaty that sort of was the last um, sort of issue standing that was still being compartmentalized that's now being affected, which just shows you how 
you know, to what extent the war against Ukraine has become the overarching organizing principle, let me put it this way, of, of Russian foreign policy. I think the arguments to post to the Russians as to why they should still compartmentalize nuclear arms control, come back in compliance with New START, uh, are all there on the table and have been raised on this panel. It's And, and they're being made by Russian arms control specialists as well. It's the economic argument um, and the fact that Russia, if we assume that it will be in a protracted war against Ukraine and will um, be economically suffering and will be less able to ramp up production in, of its military industrial complex than the United States or China, will be losing out over the medium to long term. So there's the economic argument. There is the sort of geostrategic argument given Russia's location. And again, Russian analysts themselves writing that given where Russia is, an emerging multipolar nuclear world is, is quite a dangerous uh, world for Russia given where it is. Um, and I think to you know, one just has to hope that those those arguments will resonate uh, with with the Russian government. Then there's also the issue that if if New Star collapses and there's no follow on uh, talks for for sort of one or multiple agreements that will supersede the treaty, Russia will have no chance of addressing any of the other issues that it had hoped to discuss with the United States, including missile defenses, long range precision guided missiles, or any of those other systems. So. Uh, I think one just has to hope that those arguments will, will resonate with Russia. And again, I would go back to my last point in my opening remarks. There's also a role to be played for, for other constituencies in the international community to make that case to the Russians. Thank you, Hannah. Matt, you're up next for a quick follow-up question we have from a participant who's asking of the estimates you had given for upload potential. How quickly do you foresee those being able to occur? Yeah, so it's a great question. Um, and I, I touched on a little bit in my presentation. Um, but really, you know, it, it sort of depends on the system. As I mentioned, um, with submarines, this is something that would take quite a bit of time because they're on typically a rotating schedule where some are going in and out of port for maintenance and, and various other things. So that's when we would expect an upload to occur. Um, for ICBMs, it would be potentially a little bit faster. But when we think about Russia's geography, right, in particular, this is a, they're dispersed um, quite heavily. And, and there are also, there are a lot of costs associated with doing these kinds of uploads, because you have to have an immense amount of security. Um, you have to, you know, open up silos, you have to do things like that. This, this all is a, is a big cost argument. And so I think Hannah's point about the economic arguments um, in favor of a new start extension are, are really key here, because even just something, you know, putting aside building entirely new delivery systems, but even something as simple as an upload, it, it is expensive, right? So the, these things um, are not something that's in both sides mutual interests. The bombers are, are something that I think would be done a lot quickly, um, a lot, sorry, a lot faster. Um, you know, these are things that can just be sort of moved onto air bases. Uh, but, you know, it's a, it, it's still, it's quite an expense when you sort of um, play it all out across the entire triad. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Matt. And then Steve, I have two questions that I'm going to put to you from participants in the chat and also some questions we had gotten beforehand. So first is more on the issue of inspections. So how do you assess how do you assess the attitudes towards the new start change in, in the US if the inspections do not resume in a month, six months, a year? What kind of responses do you see from the administration in that case? And then second is more about broader arms control talks. So what's the drop dead date by when negotiators must realistically begin talks for a successor treaty? In other words, how much time realistically could it take to agree on a, propo on a proposed new treaty? Over to you. Oh, thanks, Shannon. On, on the first question, I mean, you know, my, my sense is the administration sees great value in New START. They would like to keep the treaty in effect but the longer this goes without on-site inspections, we're now at the two and a half year point, you know, it, it will raise questions about the ability to deter cheating. And, and, and we won't have the mechanism in place that allows us to, to check on the Russian numbers. So I think you're going to see greater pressure on the administration uh, to move away from New START. Uh, you saw that already in Representative Rogers, where you know, he came out and said that the Joint Chiefs should assume, should assume that Russia exceeds the new start limits when the client compliant or the report that was put out by the State Department specifically said that while the U.S. government has less confidence in the past, 
the U.S. government assesses that Russia likely is under those limits. So you're going to see that kind of pressure. And it's going to come at a time, bear in mind, where the United States is ramping up production for new strategic systems, building a new intercontinental ballistic missile, the B-21 bomber, and new ballistic missile submarines. So my guess is you may begin to see some pressure from those and those who have not been fans of arms control in the past for the United States to take some of the steps that Matt has outlined in terms of uploading weapons, but perhaps an even increasing the planned buy of new weapons as, the, as part of the administration's current modernization program. So I think that's the pressure that you're going to want to see. And it's only going to increase with time because the longer we go without the on-site inspections, the greater the question mark, the less confidence we have about the Russian declared numbers. On when is the drop dead date? I mean, I'm reluctant to assign a specific drop dead date. I would have said in 2021 that for the Biden administration, if they wanted to have a follow on, they should have it negotiated by the end of 2023. That's because traditionally you don't want to have a treaty up at the Senate uh, for consent to ratification in an election year because the treaty runs the risk of getting caught up in politics. You know, we're now in 2023. And so my guess is what's going to happen is, you know, th there may not be a drop dead date, but the ability to do something ambitious is going to be reduced the less time they have. You know, extending New START on its terms probably would not be a difficult negotiation if there were political will on both sides in Washington and Moscow, and if the Chinese numbers were not seen as too much of a third country threat. Uh, but if you want to do something more, like the Biden administration said it would like to do, and I think they're right, trying to get to a U.S.-Russia agreement that covers all their nuclear weapons, you know, the time is getting short because you'll have to get into things like verification measures, including inspections of weapons and storage sites that are going to be very difficult for both sides to work out. So again, I, I, the way I put it is the less time we have, uh, the less ambitious we can be in terms of what a new start follow-on might look like. Jim, thank you, Steve. All right, Hannah, you're up next. I have a simple question from a participant that I'm going to add on a little bit to. So the participant asked, what is the single biggest obstacle to a new meaningful arms control agreement? You've, honest, you've touched on this question a fair amount in your remarks already. So I want to try and pull from your Deep Cuts Commission, the US German Russian group, for more of a European perspective on this on this question, um, like I said, you've you've touched on Russia's perspective. We've had Steve and Matt talking on U.S. perspective as well, but I want to broaden it a tiny a little bit more, especially because we have you on our on our panel and can lend some um, arguments to this question. So over to you. Thank you, Shannon. Well. I'm joining you today from Berlin, and let me first say that I think that the whole issue of what's going on with the New START Treaty and Russia turning its back on nuclear arms control is receiving very little attention here in Germany. Uh, I'm not sure how it is in other European capitals, but it might, might not be all that different. I think that we are currently so consumed by the develop, daily developments in the war against Ukraine, how that has shifted our strategic environment the sort of immediate needs of, of helping Ukraine wage that war, that what is happening in a few years time in terms of the broader strategic picture, I think is not getting enough attention in the debate as it happens here in Berlin. That's sort of the first thing to say. And I think that's also a problem if we want to talk about sort of mobilizing uh, support for the continuation of, of that treaty and, and the future of nuclear arms control. But of course, um, in terms of European views of sort of what should happen next, um, this war um, that's been unfolding for the last year has really shaken us out of a certain complacency uh, over the last years and decades. And I think, you know, if, if a few years ago there was appetite in Germany to see uh, non-strategic nuclear weapons removed from, from German soil, for instance, the attitudes on that front have shifted. I think there's a lot of mistrust now vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Um, so I think um, there's that to be contended with. And then potentially, I would say, some divergences within Europe in terms of how one looks at the future of, of arms control with Russia. I think, uh, you know, if you ask uh, colleagues from, from Poland or from the Baltic states, they will be highly, highly suspicious now of any kinds of agreements with Russia, whereas perhaps countries like Germany or France 
um, might see more of a room. And I think there's also a sort of um, 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 a need to manage those potential discrepancies uh, going forward. So I think there's sort of a lot, a lot going on also in terms of manage, managing intra-European differences in terms of how to how to address that problem set uh, going forward. Thank you, Hannah. Moving along to Matt. So we have a question about an option for um, 2026 that I know we at ACA have written about as well, but I'm going to, we want to hear what the FAS and Matt's perspective is on this. So from Bruce McDonald, we have uh, a question asking for the viewpoint on an option that should that should no follow on New START agreement be reached, it would be for both sides to agree not to exceed the central limits of New START, somewhat like the Reagan administration did with SALT II in the mid 80s, to keep at least some limits in place as a matter of policy, though without the force of a treaty. So Matt, over to you to hear your take. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, and, and thank you, Bruce, for raising it. So yeah, so this is um, certainly a possibility, right? The idea of sort of a, a gentleman's agreement to continue uh, with exchanges and to continue uh, staying within the limits even uh, without the formal structure of a treaty. It does raise a few challenges um, and it's why we sort of think about it as, as perhaps a Band-Aid solution or, or as a bridge, right? And 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 it it was used as a bridge solution in, in many instances, as you indicate, and also during the bridge period between start and new start um, during which the United States continued to exchange notifications as sort of a, a goodwill gesture. Um, and so in theory, you can imagine that that this kind of thing would be reciprocated again uh, after 2026. The potential issues that come into play with this are that you lose um, a lot of the kind of formal verification mechanisms um, that are sort of enshrined in the treaty, right? Because the treaties, annexes and protocols and things like that have really specific instructions for how inspections are supposed to take place, right? Down to the call signs of the aircraft and things like that. In theory, you know, we can continue those things beyond 2026, but there isn't a formal, you know, treaty structure anymore um, to, to bind folks to that. And so what could potentially happen is that you run into the risk of uh, perhaps assessments being more on the lines of ranges, right? Saying that, okay, well, we have this percent confidence that, you know, this de declaration is accurate uh, and it's lower than, you know, what it used to be. Or we would assess that, you know, um, Russia is, is getting to an upper boundary of, you know, between X and Y number of warheads rather than a specific number. And when you get into, when you start to get into those uncertainties, um, especially if it bumps up quite close to the, the upper warhead limits, it starts to become a political issue, right? Where, where a lot of, you, you can sort of imagine a situation where um, political figures wanting to make sort of a point or, or kind of stake their flag to something say, oh, like this range is a little too close uh, to the warhead cap and it's a little too uncertain. And now we can sort of make a make it our own personal assessment that Russia may no longer be in compliance with this sort of gentleman's agreement. And so you by losing that sort of formal verification mechanism, you you run into those political challenges. Um, so I think it's a it's a good bridge and it's a great band-aid solution. And I, and I think you know, if we don't have a treaty following 2026, it's a good, it's a good thing to continue if possible but it's not really seen, at least from my perspective, as a long-term solution, um, especially given that historically Russia has actually been the one who has insisted on having these more legally binding frameworks as opposed to uh, something that's a little more fluid. Gotcha. Thank you, Matt. So we're running a little bit short on time. So what I want to do now is I'm, I have one more question for each of you. And then when I come to you with the question, if you can tack on any closing remarks, that would be great. And then we'll kick it over to Daryl for our last to introduce our last speaker. So first, I want to start with you, Steve. We had a question in the chat that that asks, given Russia's war of aggression, what steps could the United States take unilaterally to fulfill its Article 6 obligations under the NPT? In other words, to what extent during this period can the U.S. set an example to be "quote unquote" constructive? Over to you for the question to answer the question and final remarks. Yeah, I, th I think that the uh, what the U.S. can do is uh, to continue to try to abide by the New Start limits, but as I said, that is going to become more difficult 
uh, for military reasons, but also politically in the United States, the longer that we go with this period of Russian non-compliance. And, and I guess I'd make the point here is, um, New START, um, it's not an American gift to Russia. Uh, and so those who think in those terms and say we ought to you know, withdraw from New START because it's a gift to Russia, I think they're wrong. But likewise, it's also not a Russian gift to the United States. And, and so I think it is a significant mistake for Moscow now to try to hold New START hostage to differences, and there are very real and major differences between the United States and Russia, particularly over Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. You know, this is an agreement that the sides mutually agreed met their national security interests. Uh, but if they start playing it as a gift to one or the other, they're going to end up in a situation which I believe will be worse for both. And that is a situation in which there are no constraints on uh, their nuclear arms competition. That will be bad for strategic stability. It will be bad for transparency, predictability, and it will be very expensive for both sides. Thank you, Steve. And next we'll go to Hannah. So we just got a question in the chat asking, why did Russia choose not to comply with the New START Treaty? Which I think you've touched on a little bit, but if you can answer that one more directly. And there is a follow-up question to that about when combined with Russia's previous non-compliance with other treaties, what does this mean for U.S. assumptions going into future U.S. arms control, future arms control treaty negotiations? So if you wanna address that second question at all, and then any final remarks, thanks. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. I mean, I, I really do think that Russian non-compliance with this treaty, even though this inspection issue when it um, uh, was again tabled by the Russians on August 8th, uh, sort of stating technical reasons why uh, inspections couldn't be resumed, um, was was a sort of packaged as a technical problem. It is really a political tool. This is a political matter for Russia. It is blocking the BCC for political reasons. It is not resuming inspections under the treaty for political reasons. The game for Russia now is much bigger. It is engaged in a war against Ukraine. And I think it sees that as an existential struggle and um, wants to force the United States to reconsider its support for Ukraine by making that very vital issue, the future of nuclear arms control, hostage. I think that is really what is going on here. Um, it is a fairly sort of desperate uh, attempt, I think, because I don't see the United States folding and sort of responding in the way that Russia wishes to that kind of hostage taking of nuclear arms control. But I think that is sort of the Russian calculation, at least for the time being. Now, the question is, if that Russian calculation doesn't pan out over the coming months or a year or so, will Russia eventually reconsider that nuclear that that blackmail and return into the to the bilateral consultative commission and resume inspections? I think that's very hard to predict because the war is ongoing and we don't know where we will be in that war in six months from now or in a year from now. But it would be my assumption that the trajectory of that confrontation will will have a you know the most significant impact on the on Russia's position on that issue going forward. Thank you, Hannah. And then to close us out, Matt, we are coming to you. So you, and we've touched on China a few times over the course of this panel, but we know that in 2021, you had been along with the Middlebury Institute, you had been part of the, the team that essentially had found some additional silos under construction in China. So can we get an update on the construction of China's new ICBM solos across the three locations? Have there been any notable developments and how might these developments, as I said already, we've touched on this a little bit, but how might these developments further impact future arms control discussions between the US and Russia, as well as potential conversations between US and China? Yeah, thanks very much. Um, great question. So yeah, so um, certainly we've, you know, been watching these, uh, the new silo construction pretty closely. Um, there are a lot of new developments with them. Construction is is going, you know, quite quite rapidly, and we're seeing that um, sort of the rudimentary outline of what we sort of originally looked at uh, in 2021 has sort of now really started to take shape, and and we're sort of getting a better sense of um, what each silo field is likely going to look like when it's finished, right? So we're seeing some new structures relating to. Uh, potential air defense systems, perimeters, um, you know, the shelters are coming down, the, those sorts of things. We're still many years away from uh, likely from them actually becoming operational. Um, but it's clear, right, that that we can see that China is certainly 
at least it appears that they are um, sort of working towards an ICBM force that looks very similar to what we can see in the United States uh, and in Russia. And so that does create questions, right, for arms control and uh, for what China intends to do with its nuclear forces, right? I, I would imagine, at least this is sort of my um, assumption based on uh, the official kind of lack of responses that we've heard from, from Chinese political and military officials about these, uh, these new developments is that they don't, I think, feel the need to engage the United States uh, or any other country on arms control right now. I think they probably feel that um, time is on their side uh, and that they can just continue to, to build um, until they feel satisfied with the trajectory of their nuclear forces and then, um, and then probably will stop, right? So uh, it's, it, it does raise a lot of questions about um, you know, how this could potentially fit into a, to a new arms control agreement right, between the United States and Russia. But I think just to sort of put a, put a point on it here is that you know, with regards to the US and Russia and also with China, um, what appears to be perhaps the optimal outcome for each of those countries, right? Where the, whether it's building up, you know, well beyond their their current nuclear force postures, is is going to produce a a worse outcome on the international stage and for strategic stability, right? This is a classic game game theory problem, right? Where if everyone is taking actions that only benefit themselves, um, then you you end up with a with a much greater problem uh, for everyone. So I think I think that's sort of what we're seeing right now. All right. Thank you, Matt. And thank you to all of our panelists for a grim, yet there are a grim conversation, but I think that there are points that we've touched on, on areas to potentially guard against a world or mitigate it, at least a world without any constraints on U.S. and Russian nuclear arsenals. So thank you again very much. And we are going to hand it over to Daryl to close it out with our final speaker. Well, thank you very much, Shannon, uh, and to those excellent presentations. Um, uh, as we have discussed here uh, today, uh, this is not just an issue for American and Russian uh, experts, politicians, citizens, but uh, the issue of global nuclear arms control and disarmament, particularly between the two largest nuclear uh, weapons holders, is an issue of concern for everyone, um, especially those uh, on the front lines uh, between uh, the Western European states and Russia. And uh, we're very happy to have with us here from Finland, uh, Jarmo Venanen, who's the ambassador for strategic and arms control issues at the Finnish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, he has a long career uh, in the field. Um, he has played a very important role already in the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty uh, review process, um, was a key facilitator of discussions at the 2022 NPT Review Conference and is the chair designate of the uh, preparatory committee meeting for the next NPT Review Conference uh, in 2026. Um, so uh, uh, Yormo, thank you very much for joining us. Um, he is going to be speaking about uh, the US-Russia nuclear arms control uh, situation from a European security perspective and offer some thoughts about the implications for the broader nuclear non-proliferation regime. Welcome. Thank you very much, Daryl. It's nice of you to invite me to participate in this event. Of course, it's a very daunting task to speak after such a wonderful panel. The US-Russian relationship has a direct impact on international security and progress on nuclear arms control between two, these two nations is critical for maintaining international stability and preventing the proliferation of nuclear weapons. There's a widely shared view in the international community that the two overwhelming the largest nuclear weapon holders have a special responsibility to spearhead nuclear arms control and disarmament. The US and Russia have seen and have used bilateral arms control as a means of promoting their own security interests and thus also responded to the international expectations. There is a continuum for over 50 years of nuclear arms control between these countries. Russian and American nuclear weapon stockpiles are today 80% plus lower than they were at the highest in the 1980s. It is yet good reason to remember 
that even today, you, the US and Russian nuclear arsenals constitute over 90% of world's total stockpiles. All nuclear arms control treaties have so far been bilateral US-Russia slash Soviet agreements. Despite this, the security impact of these treaties has been and is global. It is no wonder that nearly all nations expressed support for the extension of the new start before and after February 2021. Especially Europe has been a beneficiary of the US-Russia arms control. We Europeans in general terms tend to cherish the stability and predictability, predictability treaties provide. We consider arms control treaties to be part of the rules-based international order and clearly in our interests. Sometimes this is manifested in utmost flexibility and tolerance, even when it comes to issues of non-compliance. Of course, there are diverging views on these issues between European nations too, as Hannah said a couple of minutes ago. There are very good reasons for the international community to be supportive of US-Russia nuclear arms control. First, it decreases the risk of nuclear conflict. By reducing and constraining their respective nuclear arsenals, the US and Russia can decrease the likelihood of accidental nuclear war and reduce tensions between the two nations. It can secondly, it can prevent nuclear proliferation. By reducing the role of nuclear weapons in, for their own security, they can demonstrate a commitment to non-proliferation and disarmament and encourage other nations to follow suit. And thirdly, US-Russian nuclear arms control can help maintain stability in international relations by reducing the risk of conflict and establishing a framework for cooperation between the two nations. And fourthly, the US-Russia leadership on nuclear arms control can set an example for other nations to follow, encouraging them to join in a force to reduce the threats posed by nuclear weapons. So far, the United States and Russia have been able to insulate nuclear arms control from the overall developments in their bilateral relationship. It has been possible to agree and implement a nuclear arms control even the relationship has been otherwise very constrained. The Russian war in Ukraine seems to have changed this paradigm. Especially Russia has used the deteriorated relationship as an excuse to not to comply with all provisions of the new start. And Hanna shed excellently uh, light on this, this development. And of course, Russia has been for a long time complaining that it has not been able to verify, fully verify the US compliance with the treaty referring to the conversions on B-52 bombers and then the American SSBNs, as Steve said earlier in his presentation. The outlook for continued US-Russian nuclear arms control is bleak, as has been highlighted by the excellent presentations in this webinar. Further progress or regress in, of US-Russian nuclear arms control will have a major impact on international security. If there will be no follow-up treaty, treaties or arrangements after the new start exp expiration or collapse before that, it will be considered a sign of further instability in relation between US and Russia. This sense of instability will most probably spread around the globe and heighten regional and local tensions. This might in turn increase the risk of armed conflict escalation, and I'd rather not go any further on this ladder. The fate of US-Russia nuclear arms control is going to have a major impact on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. The NPT is undoubtedly a ma major success in curbing nuclear proliferation and providing sound legal basis for peaceful uses of nuclear applications. And the treaty holds a legally binding commitment to nuclear disarmament, rightly or wrongly. For many NPT states parties, the treaty is foremost a disarmament treaty and its value is considered mainly through this angle. 
There is a growing frustration by the majority of the NPT states parties for the slow or non-existent pace of nuclear disarmament. The collapse of bilateral uh, nuclear arms control between Russia and the United States would be seen by majority of states parties as a sign of non-commitment to nuclear disarmament and increased salience on nuclear weapons. This would give further impetus for voices which are already questioning the value of the NPT. I don't foresee a major exodus from the NPT. The benefits of the treaty are too great and the consequences for leaving too harsh. Anyhow, criticism, criticism on slow pace of nuclear disarmament needs to be taken seriously and support and the support for NPT and nuclear non-proliferation should not be taken for granted. It's good to remember that if there would be one additional nation possessing nuclear weapons, there would be many to follow the suit. It is obviously difficult for the US and Russian governments to factor in their considerations how an end to nuclear arms control would affect nuclear non-proliferation and the NPT especially. From my perspective, this remains a valid concern. In conclusion, US-Russian progress on nuclear arms control is critical for maintaining inter international security, reducing the risk posed by nuclear weapons and curbing nuclear proliferation. The US and Russian Federation have a special responsibility to lead the world in this effort and their leadership on this issue will set an important example for other nations to follow. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Um, that's very helpful and a uh, very important perspective on uh, the stakes um, that uh, we're facing right now. We're uh, very short in time, so um, we're not going to take any questions for Ambassador Vananan. Um, but I did just want to note um, related to the NPT that uh, at one point, last year at the NPT review conference, Russia and the United States and other states parties did agree uh, that they would include language in the final document to pursue negotiations in good faith on a successor framework to New START before its expiration in 2026 in order to achieve deeper, irreversible and verifiable reductions in their nuclear arsenals. Uh, I think uh, the goal for us and many others um, and I'm sure Ambassador Vananen uh, will be to try to get the United States and Russia back to that point again um, uh, at some point in 2023. Um, so to conclude, there is a lot at stake uh, here. Uh, we hope this session has been very uh, helpful in illuminating uh, the issues and the challenges and some of the solutions. Um, on behalf of the Arms Control Association, I just want to emphasize that new start will expire in exactly 1,100 days. In the longer that Russia and Mr. Putin blocks effective engagement between Russia and the United States on nuclear arms control diplomacy, on the resumption of inspections under new start, the more likely it is that US and Russian arsenals will be left unconstrained for the first time since 1972, which uh, will, as we just heard, make a more difficult relationship between the two nuclear adversaries even more unpredictable. So I want to thank everyone, all the speakers today. Um, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, a recording of today's briefing will be archived on the Arms Control Association website, armscontrol.org. Uh, please uh, keep an eye out for updates on developments through our monthly journal, Arms Control Today. Uh, we have an e-newsletter, uh, the Nuclear Disarmament uh, uh, news, nuclear Disarmament Watch newsletter. Uh, you can sign up for that and get further updates from our team. With that, we are, uh, we're done for today and uh, this session is over and I look forward to seeing you again in the future. Thanks. <laughs>